Freud, of course, identified one of the problems that contributed to the suffering we might associate with mental illness with repression, which is kind of like a lie of omission. That's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. And Jung stated straight out that there was no difference between the psychotherapeutic, the curative psychotherapeutic effort and supreme moral effort, including truth. That, those were the same thing as far as he was concerned. And Carl Rogers, another great clinician who was at one point a Christian missionary before he became um, more, more, more strictly scientific, he believed that it was in truthful dialogue that, that, that uh, clinical transformation took place. And, you know, it, 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 and of course, one of the prerequisites for genuine transformation in the clinical setting is that the therapist tells the truth and the client tells the truth, because otherwise, how in the world do you know what's going on? How can you solve a problem when you don't even know what the problem is? And you don't know what the problem is unless the person tells you the truth. That's something really to think about in light of your own relationships, because you know, if you don't tell the people around you the truth, then they don't know who you are. And maybe that's a good thing, you know, because, well, seriously, people have reasons to lie, right? I mean, that aren't trivial. But it's really worth knowing that you can't even get your hands on the problem unless you formulate it truthfully. And if you can't get your hands on the problem, the probability that you're going to solve it is, is just so low. And so then I've been thinking about, as well, the, this, this, and, and this idea has become more credible to me the, the longer I've developed it, the, the, the longer I've thought about it, you know, the, using the term dominance hierarchy, which might be fine for like chimpanzees and for lobsters and, and, and for creatures like that, but not, not, for, not, not for chimpanzees even so much. And, and he said something very interesting. He thought that the idea of dominance hierarchy was actually a projection of a early 20th century quasi-Marxist hypothesis onto the animal kingdom that was being observed and the notion that the hierarchical structure that you see that characterizes, say, mating hierarchies in, in chimps, for example, the idea that that was predicated on power was actually a projection of a kind of political ideology. And I thought, that really bugged me for a long time when he said that, because, <laughs> like, because I'd really been used to using the term dominance hierarchy, and I thought, he, he told me all that, and I thought, ugh, that's so annoying. It's so annoying, because it might be right, and, and it took me months to think about it. And then I, and then I was also reading Franz de Waal at the same time, time, and he's a primatologist, and also Jack Panksepp, who's, who's a brilliant, brilliant affective neuroscientist who unfortunately just died. He wrote a great book called Affective Neuroscience, and for rats to play, they have to play fair or they won't play with each other. And that's, that's a staggering discovery, right, because anything that helps um, instantiate the, uh, the emergence of ethical behavior in animals and that associates it with an evolutionary process, which is essentially what, what, what Panksepp was doing, gives credence to the notion that the ethics that guide us are not mere sociological epiphenomenal constructs. They're deep, deeply rooted. If rats, and they're rats for God's sake, you can't trust them, and they still play fair, you know. And DeWall noticed that the chimp troops that he studied, like the, it, wasn't, it wasn't the barbar barbaric chimp that ruled with an iron fist that was the successful ruler, because he kept getting torn to shreds by his by the compatriots that he ignored and stomped on. As soon as he showed some weakness, they'd just tear him into pieces. The chimp leaders that were stable, you know, that had a stable kingdom, let's say, were very reciprocal in terms of their interactions with their friends, and chimps have friends, and they, ask, they actually last for a very long time, chimp friendships, and they were also very um, reciprocal in their inter interactions with the females and with the infants. And I, I thought, that's a, that's a, friends to wall is a very smart guy. And I thought that was also foundational science because it's really something to note that the attributes that give rise to dominance in a male dominance hierarchy, sorry to use that word, let's call it authority, that might be better, or even shudder competence, which I think is a better way of thinking about it, is that that's not predicated purely on anything that's, that's, that's as simple as brute power. And I think too, you know, I think as well that the idea, and this is a deeply devious and dangerous political idea in my estimation, the idea that male dominance hierarchies, sorry, male hierarchies are fundamentally predicated on power in a, in a law-abiding law society, I think is, I think all you have to do is think about that for like a month, say, <laughs> which isn't that long, to understand how absurd that is. Because most people who are in positions of authority, let's say, are just as hemmed in by ethical responsibility, or even more so, than people at the other levels of the, of the hierarchy. And we know this even in the managerial literature, because we know, generally speaking, that 
managers are more stressed by their subordinates than the subordinates are stressed by their managers. And that's not surprising. You, know, you want to be responsible for like 200 people? You really want that? That's hard work, man. And I mean, I know it's a pain to have a boss because you have to care about what the boss thinks. And maybe the person is arbitrary, in which case they're not going to be particularly successful. But it's no joke to be responsible for 200 people. And you have to behave very carefully when you're in a position of responsibility and authority like that because you will get called out if you make mistakes constantly. So it's not like you're, it's not like because you have a position that's higher up in the hierarchy that you're less constrained by ethical necessity. Now if you're a psychopath, well that's a whole different story, but psychopaths have to move pretty rapidly from hierarchy to hierarchy, right? Because they get found out quite quickly. And as soon as their reputation is shattered then they can't get away with their shenanigans anymore. <clears throat> 